Greetings, friends, and thanks for joining my class. I am Mistress Gianetta Andreini da Vicenza from the Mid Realm, and I want to share with you everything I've learned about the salons that took place in the gardens of Florentine nobles during the 1520s. Uh, this was a super interesting and exciting time where artists, musicians, nobles, politicians, everyone was gathering and exchanging ideas together. So I wanna tell you all about that, uh, but to get there, we need a brief history lesson first. So we're talking about Florence and the family name most associated with Florence is of course, the Medicis. So let's learn a little bit about how the Medicis become such a powerful force for patronage in Florence. Let me just share my screen. Great. So it all starts with this guy, Cosimo Il Vecchio. Notice he's from the late 14th to the early 15th century. Um, he is new money. He's a banker, so he doesn't come from an ancient and honorable family. He's uh, effectively nouveau riche, and he decides that the way to establish his name as famous and powerful is through creating a legacy of art patronage, uh, physical artworks, architecture, music, um, and not just any kind of patronage, the way many wealthy and old families were doing but he was going to get the best from all over Europe, the world as they knew it. Uh, and he's able to do this because of his connections. He has banks all over Europe at the height of the Medici power, and they act as talent scouts. So if you have a, a bank in France, you have someone looking out for the hot artists and musicians in France at the time, and they say, come to Florence, come share your talents. The Medicis will sponsor you to create new works and collaborate with other artists in Florence. So through this influence, the Medicis make Florence the center of artistic life. So the Medici dynasty continues um, all the way through uh, Cosimo's grandson, this guy. Lorenzo de Medici, known as Lorenzo il Magnifico. And throughout the 15th century, he is the person of power from the Medici family. Family. He not only spreads the reputation for very high quality patronage, he also extends uh, to public and secular works. In Cosimo's time, much of the artwork that he was sponsoring was either for private consumption amongst the Medici family grounds or for religious purposes, sponsoring the building of churches of uh, religious music. And Lorenzo says, I want to share these works with the people. So he creates secular music. He creates a national band called the Pifari that he expands in Florence to play at state events. Um, he's also very interested in recreating the Platonic acad academies of the time. So you can see in this picture, he's here in his garden with the sculptors presenting their work to him. He gathers a whole group of artisans around him, and he's interested in recreating uh, the ideals of uh, ancient Greek and Roman culture. All right, so uh, when we talk about the Renaissance, what they are, that's rebirth, right? And what they are in fact trying to create as a rebirth is Greek culture, philosophy, and artistic styles. You see this in the sculpture, you see this in the poetic works uh, and all throughout what's happening in Italy at that time. So in 1492, Lorenzo dies. And he leaves a power vacuum. The person who inherits the leadership of Florence is very weak, uh, loses a battle, and there's an invasion, gets kicked out. And by 1500, uh, there's a different force running Florence. This is the Republic. And they are 
the Republican government is super anti-Medici. They create artwork that opposes everything the Medici stood for. Um, there, there's a huge political upheaval. And from 1500 to 1530, there, the leadership of Florence goes back and forth between the Medicis and the Republic. Um, there are plots, there are poisonings, there are assassinations. There are uh, Medici, there's a Medici Pope in Rome who's sponsoring a Medici to be in charge in Florence, but he's not strong enough to hold on and the Republic comes back. Florence is effectively a bad place to be effectively for the uh, average uh, aristocrat in this time. And what happens during this time is that the Medici supporters and other wealthy families of Florence retire to a life of contemplation in their country estates, which means they get the heck out of Florence and out of this very much of a hotbed of political action. So they leave, but they take their money with them. And all of these families, like the Medicis, have a history as patrons of the arts. But because they're not in the city, they can no longer sponsor monumental public works like churches, statues, murals, church music. Uh, instead, patronage goes private. So those artists, those thinkers still need a place to be and be supported by their patronage. And what happens is they go to the gardens of these wealthy families. So these families are still upholding those Renaissance ideals, reenacting the garden academies, the dialectics of Plato. They still have artists and musicians coming from all over to mingle together in these salons. So people are still coming to Florence, but instead of primarily doing their works in the city, they're going to these wealthy families and gathering together. This is where you have Franco-Flemish musicians coming and mingling with native Florentine musicians, and still a focus on primarily secular themes and works. So let's take a look at what these gardens really looked like, because it is worth understanding the context in which uh, these parties were happening and in which these artists were inspired. Okay. Here's a, a painting from the 16th century of one of these ornamental gardens. The architecture, the classical proportions, the beautiful grounds, everything is upholding those ideals of order, symmetry, beauty. And people gathering at a safe social distance, of course, <laughs> in, in these spaces. What's interesting is these gardens still exist today in almost the same form they were then. So here's an overhead view of one of these estates. And you can see again the symmetry, the beauty, and the huge space that these gardens, this isn't just like a backyard, a city backyard. It's not even the same as the villas that were in Florence for these families. They are expansive. Here's the Villa Strozzi. The Strozzi were one of the important families that were sponsoring these salons, these garden parties. And this is from, this is a modern photograph, but you can still see the beautiful, orderly, symmetric layout. Here's the Garden of the Medici in Florence. Uh, they had uh, statuary lining the walkways. They had exotic fruit trees imported. Uh, everything was to create this sense of classical beauty and wealth. Here's the Villa Rucciolai today. Rucciolai was another family that were patrons of the arts and sponsored many of these groups of artisans. So if you can imagine being a playwright or a poet and uh, being paid to come relax and create in these spaces overlooking the Tuscan countryside. Pretty inspiring. So let's talk a little bit about what happened in these spaces. Um, we've talked about the people who sponsored them. There were also these companies of, of young aristocrats and 
theater people getting together. Uh, they have names like the Cazuola, the Broncone, the Diamante, and one of the more famous, the Sacred Academy of the Medici. It was aristocrats and academics getting together. And it was almost like a crazy book club. One of the stories about the Sacred Academy of the Medici is they were almost worshipful about Dante. And they said he should be in Florence. His bones were in Ravenna where he died. And they actually did a fundraiser. They pooled their money together to go get on an expedition to go get Dante's bones and bring them back to Florence. The monks knew they were coming and hid Dante's bones in a wall of the monastery. And when the Sacred Academy of the Medici showed up to reclaim them, they said, oh, we lost the bones. We don't, we don't know where they are. And actually were uh, successful in dodging the attempt and multiple attempts actually to get Dante's bones back to Florence. So much so that those bones were actually forgotten in the walls of the monastery and they weren't rediscovered until I think the 19th century. So this is the, the kind of the flavor of these groups of mostly young, mostly men who were gathering and exchanging artistic ideas and sort of hobnobbing with the intellectuals of the time. Another person who was uh, supported, uh, who had a patron of the Ruccioli was the playwright Machiavelli. Now we know him from his most famous work, The Prince, but he also wrote satirical plays uh, like Mandragola, The Mandrake Root, and La Clisio. These are satires that very much uh, uphold the spirit of what we know about Machiavelli's view of the world. Machiavelli was a very controversial political figure as well. He was in and out of favor with the Medici. Uh, he was a Republican. He tried, he was involved with a, a plot to assassinate the Pope and then apologized to the Pope. So he's kind of laying low and trying to be creative artistically to win favor with whoever happens to be in power at the moment. Uh, another person who worked in these spaces was Alemanni, who is not only a famous poet in his own right, but his poems were used as the text for many madrigals. He was mostly secretly a Republican, a supporter of the Republic, until he got louder about it. He actually got kicked out of Italy and had to go to France and wrote mournful poems about missing Italy. Uh, some of the composers you may have heard of who created their works under these patronages. Uh, Philippe Verdelot, he's a Franco-Flemish uh, composer, wrote many famous madrigals. Uh, Sebastiano Festo was Florentine. Um, Arcadelt, Jacob Arcadelt was another uh, Franco-Flemish musician who was basically passing through and did a residency in these gardens. So many of the important creative works that we know from this time period, mm, 1510 to 1530, they were making their art in these uh, garden party salon spaces. So let's talk a little bit about what one of these salons would be like, because they had a program. Uh, they were modeled on um, Greek gatherings like this, ancient Greek gatherings. So they considered themselves to have an afternoon with friends. And it's important to imagine, we've talked about it a little, but this informal setting, this crossing of class lines, mixing together the high and the low born, the artistic and the patrons, not this formal arrangement that had come before where the patron would sponsor the work, the work would be presented to the patron, or you know, the mass would be sung in church. This is like a collaborative environment and the patrons were enjoying as much being a part of the activity as receiving the works that were created that they sponsored. So they would have theatrical presentations and in between each act of the play, they would have musical intermedi where the musicians would perform. There would be poetry reading, reading of philosophical texts, texts and treatises uh, to receive feedback. So they would share a draft of a new song they were writing and they would all collaborate and give each other feedback. Uh, there would be a banquet, a sideboard of snack. They would have snacks for afternoon parties. There would be a literary discussion. There would be political discussion 
in the concept that it was neutral territory. So for the most part, all were welcome. But you might find a shadowy corner of the garden to have a little conspiracy discussion with someone who you think is like-minded. So the idea of this space is that it was a bunch of people coming together, having studied their ancestral culture, Greek and Roman culture, sharing their works with each other and collaborating on artistic pursuits. And to me, what that sounds like the most is an SCA event. I like to imagine these garden parties, these salons, like an SCA event. Everyone comes together. Some of them are consumers, some of them are listening, some of them are producing, they're sharing works in progress, they're showing off, they are coming together to perform and sing together and play together, uh, enjoying wonderful food, uh, trying to reenact an earlier time that they found to be an ideal of the way societies should be. So for me, I find this incredibly inspiring that we, as people interested in Italian culture, as people interested in historic culture, we are not inventing this in the SCA. This is an ancient tradition that goes back, uh, certainly to the garden parties of the 1520s in Florence. So this is the end of the first part of this class. Uh, there will be a separate a uh, conversation specifically about the music that came out of this period, because one of the things that was so vital about this time is it was the very beginnings of the form of the madrigal from the sort of folk songs and pop songs of the time uh, to the sort of high form that we find later. This is the moment when this creative collaborative environment creates a space where they can evolve the musical form to a new place. So if you're interested in the music of the time, come back for the second part of this class. And thanks for listening. Greetings, friends. Again, I am Mistress Gianetta Andreini da Vicenza from the Mid Realm, and this is part two of my class on the Florentine salons and the creative environment in uh, Florence around 1520. This part is gonna be specifically about the music from that time. Uh, what we talked about in part one was the setting, this uh, collaborative environment where aristocrats, politicians, poets, philosophers, uh, theater people, musicians all came together to collaborate. Uh, and quite a lot of music came out of this period, which we don't always know about in the SCA. So today I'm going to share with you some of that music and talk about the evolution of the form we now call the madrigal. Uh, in this time was the very beginning of the form of the madrigal and we're going to talk about how it gets there. For this class there's an accompanying YouTube playlist which I will link to and the way I'm structuring this class today is I'm going to talk a little bit we're going to talk about a song and then I'm going to, you're going to pause this video, listen to the song and come back and then we'll continue. So go ahead right now and find that YouTube playlist, pull it up. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the form. Okay. So one of the things that was different about these garden parties, these private grounds for patronage, is that uh, they created a different kind of environment than the kind of public works patronage that had gone before. And unlike commissioning a mass for a church, uh, this private patronage allowed for a lot more experimentation and collaboration. In the last class, we talked about this environment where everyone was bringing their first drafts to each other, working together, finding ways to improve and get feedback on their work. And what happened then is that the musical forms uh, for singing that had gone before, they were able to transform them during this time because they had this kind of hotbed of creativity and experimentation and this freedom to not just present a complete polished work or the uh, apotheosis of the form. So a couple characteristics that they were also pulling from that 
emulating the ancient Greek ideals was having dialogue, verbal exchanges, uh, female versus male, you know, opposites uh, back and forth. And in a lot of the music from this period, you'll hear back and forth sections in the music. So let's talk about what the Florentine music style was that came before. So there was church music and that was pretty complex musically, although lyrically very restricted to the sacred texts. There was also occasional music that had been written, instrumental, that was very complicated, all sorts of flourishes, interweaving parts. But for secular music, there was a couple of different forms that were coming. And we're talking about 1500 and earlier in Florence. There is a Florentine style. And one of the aspects of Florence is carnival. It's a huge celebration in Florence still today. And also like we see in Brazil and other countries, huge party before Lent starts, right? And there were parade floats. Uh, and so there was carnival music that was written to be sung from these parade floats during the carnival parade. So these songs would have been homophonic, which means everyone is singing at the same time. There's no different parts going on, even though there's multiple singing lines, they're all singing at the same time. It's easy to understand. The text is very declamatory, it's loud. Uh, it's something you can hear from a parade float going by. And often these songs have many, many verses because it's a long parade route. One of the great examples is the first thing in the playlist. It's called Caro della Morte by Giovanni da Firenze. Uh, and this is a song that would actually be at the end of the parade after all of the joyful uh, body celebrations. This is a song the musicians would dress in skull masks and black robes. And the lyrics are, we the penitent dead are remorseful for the way we caroused during life. And if you don't mend your ways, you will end up like us. So a very uh, sort of gruesome, shocking and admonishment at the end to transition from carnival into Lent. So in spite of that kind of alarmist, uh, context, the music itself is very beautiful. And you'll hear this particular recording is very slow. So you can imagine them going across in this parade float. So pause this video and take a moment to listen to as much of Caro della Morte as you wish. There are many verses. So you heard in Caro della Morte how everyone is singing at the same time. It's easy to understand the words. You can hear very clearly. Now there's another kind of secular music happening in Florence, which is the lauda. And this is a song that a singer would sing solo with a lute. These are often setting poems to music. They're very expressive, very, they may not stay in like a very even time, right? They, they can take their time with a phrase. There's a lot of word painting. Like if they're talking about being lifted, the music would go up. If they are talking about being heavy, the music is slow and low. So they're doing this, word painting is like a way of being expressive to convey the meaning of, of the words in the poem that you are singing. So that is happening. And then from that, what, another form that arises is the fratola, another secular form. This is effectively the pop songs of late 15th century and early 16th century Florence. A frittola is a secular song with one main musical line and other singers singing on parts, filling in the harmony, but as if they were the strumming of the lute. And these have verse, chorus, verse structures, just like pop songs today. You've got a nice, easy chorus everyone can sing along to. The verses go, you know, have several rounds. They're still pretty short songs, pop songs, right? Three minutes or less. Um, and we have a great example of this. They're, they're always secular. Sometimes they're love songs. Um, the one we have for you today is a body song called Pandemulio, which is in the guise of a marketplace seller selling his bread. He's saying he has a great basket of bread. Ladies, come and taste it while it's hot. You'll find that it turns your face red. 
So now take a pause and listen to Pandemilio, uh, a, a really fun song, and you'll hear what the pop songs of the day, the Fritola, sounded like. Okay, so we've talked about the musical predecessors to the madrigal. These are the songs that the musicians who were writing and performing in these Florentine salons would know what they would have listened to. Not only the very complex occasional and church music that was being created, but these secular singing forms that came before. And they start playing with the form. They say, oh, well, we could do some of that fancy, complicated uh, polyphonic music where there's different entrances. We can take some of our Greek dialectic forms where there's dialogue in the song. And we can take that context of word painting. Let's be expressive in our lyrics, like the lauda. Let's pick topics like that are pastoral, that are comedic, or sad love songs. These came from the uh, fr from the poems that they were based on. Let's use a very easy to hear natural melodic style like is in the Fertola. They're easy to listen to. They're not uh, musically super challenging to the ear like the Fertola. Um, let's start with a homorhythmic text like from that carnival music. Most of the time everyone's going to sing together, but we're going to start ornamenting and decorating and playing with that form. And you'll hear in that dialogue, you'll hear pairing of the soprano alto lines. They'll sing a little bit, and then the tenor basses will sing a little bit. They're doing a male-female dialogue in the music. So they take these chordal passages where everyone's singing the same, and then they'll do these counterpoint imitative passages where everyone staggers entrances and comes in. So let's hear one of those uh, by Sebastiano Festa. This is L'Ultimo di De Maggio. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, Festa was working in this time, around 1520. He influenced Philippe Verdelo, who's probably more famous than Festa. But you're going to hear a lot of the things we start to talk about. Entrances, cascading, but everyone kind of singing together for a little while, then they do a little experimenting. You'll hear duets. So take a listen to L'Ultimo di De Maggio, and this text is uh, enjoying the beginning of spring, L'Ultimo di De Maggio is the last day of May. But then, of course, it turns into a sad love song where she has uh, spurned his love. Okay, let's listen now. So with this piece, you can really hear, it sounds a lot like those forms that came before in its structure. We've got a chorus first chorus kind of thing but they're starting to experiment with more complex music happening in there. The next one we're going to listen to is by Philippe Verdolo. It's an early piece of his called Quanto sia lieto il giorno. Now this also has an interesting pedigree. The music, the words of this song are actually taken from the prologue to Machiavelli's play La Clesia, and which he wrote in during these garden parties. So you can imagine he wrote this new play and all the musicians were like, hey, nice prologue, let's set it to music. And in this one, you'll hear that same kind of call and response. You'll actually hear uh, the soprano go, yo nympha, I a nymph, and then the other voices say, et noi pastore, and we the shepherds. This one is a double meaning. Uh, the setting is, we are happy nymphs and shepherds, shepherds, we are gallivanting amongst the trees, we are a merry band of friends coming together. But it is also winkingly self-referential to these uh, salon environments themselves and those companies of players we talked about. So they say, we company of friends sing in beautiful harmony together. Uh, so it's very jokey and a lovely introduction to the play. So you can listen to, there's a professional recording, which is lovely. I also humbly submit a, a version of this uh, that my group, the Pippins, did because it's a little more up-tempo, so you can decide how you feel about that. Okay, the next piece we're going to explore is by Francesco de Laola, called Lascia il Vello. Now, this is where we're starting to get into what might, you might characterize as more of what we expect to hear when we hear a madrigal, very complex interweaving lines, but we're still staying with some of the same themes we've talked about before. 
So the lyrics are about, uh, uh, it's a love song. I have not seen you, lady. Remove your veil in sun or shadow because you knew my great desire that dispels all other wishes from my heart. So it sounds a little bit like a mournful love song, but it's also quite flirtatious. Reveal your face to me, remove your veil. So this one sound, the music is more somber, but you can hear they're experimenting with those beautiful cascading entrances and complex interweaving lines. Again, this is pretty early. Most of the magical music we study is in the second half of the 16th century. This is all before 1530 so far. So take a listen to Lachar il Velo. Okay, the last song we're going to listen to is sometimes known as the first madrigal. And when you start studying music from this time, every single song from this is known as the first madrigal. But this one is one you may have heard of before, Il Bianco e Dolce Cigno by Jacob Arcadelt. This was written in 1538, so it's a little bit later after these salons that we're talking about. But Arcadelt was there, he was passing through, he studied with these folks, and then he wrote this in this style. And again, you can hear for a madrigal, it's pretty simple, but if you compare it to Pandemilio and the Frittola from before, there's actually quite a lot of movement and complexity going on. This is again um, a sad love song telling the story of the swan singing its most beautiful song on its dying breath, but it also has a flirtatious double meaning where it says, if I could have such pleasure when I die, I would die a thousand times a day. Take a listen to Il Bianco. So we've talked about the music that came from before these salons, from around 1500 or a little before. And we've talked about how the musicians who were working in these creative hotbeds in these Florentine garden salons were able to begin to transform and synthesize all of the musical forms that went before into what we now know as the madrigal. So it's exciting to study this music because for those of us who are singers, there is a lot of value in singing later period madrigals. They are complex, they're challenging, but all of the songs we've been listening to are pretty short, pretty easy. There's a lot of passages where everyone's singing at the same time. And then there's passages that are more decorative where you can feature the different parts. They're playful. They're secular, so they have a lot to recommend them, and they are less performed than many of the songs in the sort of greatest hits of the madrigal era. So I would commend them to you as a source of deeper study. I've given you a survey of some of the most famous uh, composers of these early madrigals, but anything you go to, start looking with uh, these composers, look at things written between around 1510 and 1540, and you'll find a lot of similarities, a lot of really fun music, and also a lot of music that is equally performable by a solo singer and a lute or a guitar. Um, in the playlist, there's a few other bonus songs for you, and I have one sort of present for you at the end. They couldn't find any recordings of La Clesia, the play that was written in this time, but it looks like there's a performance of an English translation of another of Machiavelli's plays, uh, La Mandragola, The Mandrake Root. And I left you the trailer for that movie. It's, it's free, it's available. Take a look at that trailer. And for those of you who study the theater, this whole period is before what we call Commedia dell'arte. It really evolves as an improvisational art form. But when you see the characters in this play, you know that those forms from Commedia originated way back in Greek and Roman comedies of the time. And you'll recognize Il Dottore as one of the characters in this, the lovers. It's very similar to those character types we see in Commedia. So I haven't yet watched the whole play, but I invite you to do so and certainly enjoy the trailer to get a flavor of the kind of work that was coming out of this time. So thanks for listening and playing along with me with the YouTube playlist. And uh, I hope you find many more opportunities to listen to and perform this music. Once again, I'm Gianetta Andreini da Vicenza. My name is Jen Small. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I'm very available. I'm from the Mid-Realm and uh, enjoy. <laughs>